building. They're at the door. They're coming in. And there's no more room in hell. The Hungry Gamers. We'll walk here. You're going to need a bigger boat. Hello, 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 and welcome everyone to the 305th episode of the Hungry Gamers podcast. I'm your extremely humble and extremely terrified host, Brendan White. You can find me just about everywhere at Brendan8Bits. And joining me on this very special spooky edition of THG are my two favorite final girls. The first should all know very well, she's my podcast right or die, who can be found often avoiding suspect-looking VHS tapes and wells, or on the socials, at Miss Ally Hart. And the second is everyone's favourite horror hype mum, the host of the TGIF podcast and co-editor of Hear Us Scream. She can be found on the socials at CatSteed underscore Ally Cat. Welcome to the haunted, hungry studio. How the bloody hell are you? <laughs> That's funny. I thought you just said Ally Cat. And I'm like, I'm like whoa. <laughs> Oh, I did, I did, and I sort of chuckled when I wrote that in um, <laughs> earlier this morning, but uh, we are here, it is the 305th time we're doing this THG thing, and as is tradition, it is that time of year, we thought we'd get a little bit uh, freaky and scary and spooky and unsettled and all those cool adjectives, but uh, yeah, Ali, I thought it'd be good for us to bring in a horror savant, mm. one of the uh, one of the voices of the industry here, not only locally but also abroad. Cat, welcome to THG. What's going on? Um, I'm actually preparing for Halloween at the moment, so um, my nieces are going trick or treating on Monday, so I'm going to tag along as like the nerd aunt. So <laughs> I got to work out what I'm going to go as. That's I was my about issue. to ask what yeah. what are the nieces going to dress as, and you're going to sort of try and do like a family themed costume <laughs> no, set up here no. with all three of you. <laughs> they're they're both so different and have their own little individual styles and uh, you know preferences. The youngest, who is six, is going as a witch, and Classic. yeah, very Halloweeny. Uh, however, the eldest is going as I don't know because she loves anime. So in it, like her favorite character changes every week. Mm-hmm. So she did have like a Nezuko costume that she was wearing for book yes. week. Um, <laughs> she's a massive Demon Slayer fan. Um, I, I don't know what she's going as on Monday. I think she's going to probably pull something out of left field and maybe not go as anime because she's taking her friends with her. So she might think it's a little uncool. Aww. Maybe. Yeah. There's some really cool characters in anime and then. Yeah. A lot of respect for her anime fandom, and there's oh, a lot yeah. of cool <laughs> horror type characters in anime, so she could really lean into it and get all kinds of freaky and, and creepy. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what the triple threat is going to be <laughs> uh, wearing on the Monday. On the costume front, I, I'm I'm like, I love Halloween, but I, I rarely dress up and get to go to all the cool Halloween parties. So if anyone's got someone, please invite me. But um, <laughs> Have you guys got a a dream costume? Like, is there a character when you think of Halloween and dress-ups? Like, what is your Mount Everest? Like, what is the peak of as far as costumedom that you'd love to dress up as one day? Ooh. Infested Kerrigan from StarCraft. Ooh. (laughs) That'd be cool. Yes. Wings and everything. Yes. It'd be expensive. But, yeah, it'd be great. (laughs) <laughs> I um actually did a little bit of research because I wanted to dress as Carrie, but in like the blood soaked blood. like prom scene. Um, I did. I just I the thought of tipping like fake blood all over myself and then having Walking to go to work, it. yeah, still dyed red. <laughs> like that turned me off. So I don't know. Maybe Carrie or um oh um I was thinking like Billy from Saw. That'd be cool. Aww. But have a yeah, little tricycle too. Yeah, have a little tricycle. Yeah, Great. that'd be cute. I think I'd like. I'd try and just go left field and be like some random like dismembered appendage, like <laughs> like, like Mr. Arnold's arm from Jurassic Park, or like the fog from the fog, or something <laughs> like that. Like just try and do something stupid and dumb, but really make it work somehow. But uh, yeah, because I don't want to be the. <laughs> The generic Freddies and Jasons and Michaels and all that. I'd, I'd want something a little left field. And I'm not definitely going to be a killer clown from outer space because uh, I'd freak myself out there. <laughs> maybe maybe like lean into like um, 
the nemesis or like a liquor from Resident Evil with oh, the yeah. exposed brain and the big tongue and the big claw arms. Then I'd have to sort of walk around on my hands and knees the whole time. That'd be a <laughs> shitty party, but we'll see. People have to like we'll pour see. the drink into your mouth and stuff. <laughs> be Mr. X because he's just like, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. A hat and just a in a trench, trench coat, coat and a hat yeah. and just, just chase people awkwardly oh, around the party the whole time, not saying anything. Stalk after them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's uh let's move that along really quickly. <laughs> but uh yeah, Kat, maybe maybe give us the the background on yourself. Like I sort of mentioned a few things in the lead in there as far as what you're known as around around the traps. You you're very heavily invested um in the horror space, not only locally here but abroad, and you're doing some really cool things. So uh tell us more about that, please and thank you. Yeah, so during the first ever lockdowns two years ago, I started a podcast called uh, Thank God It's Friday because I was really lonely at home. I wasn't able to see my partner. So I wanted a way to be able to connect with people and talk about things that I loved and make new friends because couldn't really leave my house and go anywhere. So I did that. And then off the back of that, created Hear Our Scream, uh, which started as a personal essay anthology that we published in December last year and then kind of evolved into a website and community from there. And the main focus is by, is to amplify marginalised voices in a space that's usually othered in horror, um, always seeing, you know, we've got your tropes and stuff where um, we have you know, the token the token black guy and we see, you know, characters uh, like BIPOC characters killed off really easily. You bury your gay tropes in a lot of uh, queer um perspectives that aren't represented correctly and so yeah I wanted to provide a space where these people could talk about these things happening to them and uh, be able to do it in a place that's safe as well so I work really hard not to ever diminish someone's voice if they want to write a review in first person I'm going to let them write a review in first person Uh, I don't have a lot of restrictions about what people are allowed to talk about as long as it's not offensive to marginalized groups or um, to like uh, especially like um uh, groups that we don't really hear a lot from. So, yeah, I just wanted to platform for that. And now we're about to... Well, we're in the process of publishing the volume two, so I'm having some troubles with Amazon at the moment. They're telling me that it's too similar to what I've already published. So Funny I'm just that. like, how is it... Did you read it? <laughs> did you, It God says volume Amazon. two, you idiot. <laughs> God. So, yeah. Bezos is too busy uh, crying about all the billions he's lost this week on the on the stock market oh. from his from his share count. But uh, I've been fighting with Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it does make its way out there because yeah, I uh, you know yeah, I'm, you I'm representing nice. the, the the second shirt from the the Kickstarter run you you did for Volume Two. Um, is this is going to be a, a project I imagine that's just going to live on for as long as you can physically put the energy yeah. in and, and keep keep sort of wrangling this this very diverse and unique and, and fantastic group of people you got involved yeah, in it's awesome in writing um here a stream here a scream so we could be circling back on this in a decade and you'll be up to volume 13 potentially oh i don't know if we're going to do a volume over the next two years because we're working towards a virtual um like horror convention <gasps> So we might put a bit of a pause on it or I might move the editing team to like a group with someone that can manage the whole thing while I do something, you know, up up that alley instead. That's a bit exciting. Yeah. Can, can you share any more information on that? I really haven't gotten started only just because <laughs> <laughs> I, I put a tweet out asking, you know, who would be interested so that I can start putting together like curation teams and IT teams and design teams and whatnot and um, designate leaders that would do a really great job in those. Uh, I've already researched platforms to host the film festival element and the convention and um, other elements will come together over time. So I want to be able to bring in online shops um, where they have like special codes that only go to the people that have bought tickets for the convention uh, panels, discussions, community panels, similar to what we do at PAX, where people can submit a panel idea and then we'll provide a space for them to be able to host their panel and their discussion on whatever they choose. So That's fantastic. Cool. Yeah, and I it's going to be lots uh, of fun. <laughs> there, there's a lot of potential for this thing to uh, to blow up in the best kind of way. Hopefully, so, uh, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, hopefully uh, Hear a Scream Con is uh, coming soon to a virtual stage near you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, keep up to date with all that, obviously, at C-A-T-S-T-A-D underscore 
on the Twitters and there's a, what is it? All my links you've got in there yep. sort of in your, in your profile there that'll, that'll direct else. to everything else. But uh, yeah, we're here. We're, we're doing things a little differently on this episode of THC. We're not going to be talking news reviews, what we've been playing, et cetera, et cetera. We're just going to keep things spooky and freaky and kooky and all that kind of cool stuff. So uh, we've broken it down into four segments and uh, we've vetted all four of these segments with myself and my two fantastic co-hosts here. And uh, we might jump on in to the first segment. And uh, we thought we'd have have a have a crack at um, creating a video game. Clearly, it's not a hard thing to do. Uh, oh. So we thought we'd uh, we thought we'd throw our, our ideas into a melting pot and um, create our own unique horror game. And thought the the basis of how we'd do this is we'd have sort of a a location or a region, a concept for the game. Uh, a villain or you know an enemy archetype or however you want to describe it and then also then your hero or your heroine as well so Ali did you want to start us off and uh, pitch us your horror game based off those uh, concepts and ideas Um, I always think the best way to scare people is putting them in scenarios that they're very familiar with so my location is going to be like online or like like a computer interface and my whole concept is is that like you know as a character your best friends died mysteriously and because you're so techy you can like you know go online you could check her social medias you can like maybe she has like webcams and stuff like that and what you'll do is you'll eventually find like a cursed video so then you kind of have to investigate that and see why it's linked to murder and is it truly a cursed video vice versa so um i i always love like found footage kind of stuff but i also just like that realism that unlike voyeurism kind of haunting element so i kind of want to clash them together put them in a space that everyone's very familiar with now which is online and uh yeah i the villain is it like the villain is it going to be the cursed video or is it going to be something else um i took a lot of ideas from games like um like sarah is missing um simulacra and welcome to the game so kind of mashing all those together and putting people in like a techie space but then cursed videos and you being like like front on on a computer screen like that would be your viewpoint kind of thing and yeah that's 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 my game pitch it made me think of um that movie with john chow in it searching oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Kind, of, kind of like that kind of yeah yeah where, where the whole movie plays out through computer and phone screen um and web browsing and there's a game that uh, i got to play and i don't know if you got to play it as well cat at, at pax a couple of weeks ago but uh, Dark Web Streamer yeah. <laughs> it made me think of Dark Web Streamer where there's similar beats where you, the whole game plays out in front of a computer screen and you're trying to become the best streamer in the world. But like there's supernatural elements in the game where certain um, things, interactions occur where uh, you know, demons and spirits start invading your your world as you're playing and you can how you interact with them can then boost your viewers but also if you interact and, and do things incorrectly you can die and it's permadeath so it's 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 uh procedurally generated so every time you play it's going to be different oh, that's and good. it can go in in that's unique really directions and interactions idea. and characters it's really really well done and super creepy and super grimy and i'm very excited to play it next year when it comes out but uh i would be uh i'd be buying this game of yours miss hart yeah. i would yeah. be all <laughs> maybe about i should just it. pitch it to that studio or we'll just be like hey <laughs> you're kind of on the same it. wavelength here's yeah. also this yeah yeah add it yeah, in there as a little dlc in. pack <laughs> murder it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Reminds me of a tech horror, like a screen horror that I watched and I absolutely loved. It's called The Den. And um, it's kind of similar, like uh, she's trying to discover like what's going on and who's like following her and who knows all this stuff about her. And it's, yeah, it's a lot of like screen stuff. So yeah. she's like looking at YouTube and then she's looking at this and you you get, you get also see it from like whoever's behind the camera perspective as well. So like seeing what she's doing. Yeah. It's, it's a really cool idea. And I think playing that out in a game would be awesome. Yeah. I just think there's like the, like there's a lot of um, things now that are scary about being online and like, you know, webcams and putting your social media out there and taking photos kind of stuff so i think like having that kind of like voyeurism element to like horror is always like just in real life it's just unsettling so i always think that that's a good way to make people uncomfortable <laughs> which is what horror is oh, about yeah. <laughs> oh yeah 
Oh yeah. Um, Kat, did you want to um, pitch pitch us on your potential game? Let us let us know what uh, concept you've uh, you've worked out here. Uh, so I've gone down the found footage POV vein in like uh, we see in like Phasmophobia and um, a lot of movies that absolutely terrify the crap out of me. So a little bit like. Um, you have your cameraman, but you also have, like, the person that they're with. They're underground. I don't know um, where particularly. Maybe some caves, like some tunnels in Sydney. There's a movie called The Tunnel. Yeah. Um, it's a Sydney... It's an Australian found footage film. Um, there's also one that's coming out soon called Deep Fear, and it's in the catacombs in Paris. Ugh. So I kind of got, like, influence from those ideas. And, yeah, so it's, like, two people trapped in these tunnels. They're originally trying to find something and then find that they can't get it out. And the villains, I'm thinking, like, monsters, like The Descent, because that that's, movie that's ruined my too. life. <laughs> Severely underrated. One, one yeah. of the goats. Um, yeah, that film just absolutely ruined my teenagehood. So <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that at 16, honestly. I don't think anyone um, was. Or maybe, maybe zombies. I don't know. Because zombies scare me and I find zombies like the scariest thing on the face of the earth. But also, really? oh yeah, I have like, it's like a big, um, like what's the word? Uh, like existential thing for me. Oh. So like dying and then coming back as this thing where I'm like, I just want to die and that be it. <laughs> like, I don't want to come back as this bio weapon. I'll pass. <laughs> so yeah, I thought that'd be pretty terrifying, like trying to navigate and then only seeing through like the perspective of the camera as the player. So yeah, a little bit more like similar voyeuristic kind of feeling, but um, you're also making the decisions for the cameraman and like your main character. Hmm. Or maybe you're only the cameraman. Who knows? Who knows? It, it'd be creepy because you'd have this sense of claustrophobia in there, like walking through tunnels and, and getting into really confined spaces, spaces yeah. and then the playing off the light and dark where you've only got the you know the night mode on the camera or the, the, the stereotypical flickering flashlight as everyone seems to have. Mm. They never check their batteries and the quality of the torches <laughs> before they go into the darkness. It's always on the fritz. So... It would be great. And yeah, I thought of The Descent. Um, I thought of like As Above, So Below yeah. in, in, in parts of it as well. And um, yeah, any anything cavernesque and claustrophobic and suffocating, like that just lends itself to horror yeah. games, especially like when you've got to control that, that journey and push forward through the confined space and into the darkness, like... Mm. I can already see myself like having to take a deep breath out. Like when I get to a big moment, and I can't see any further or, you know, my torch has finally died. And then you sort of, you know, walking your way aimlessly through, touching the walls, mm. trying to see what's that. Like, ah, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm so down. There was also, um, there was also a book that I read by an author called uh, Brianna Morgan called the Reyes incident. And that's kind of like a found footage, um, like perspective change, like here, then, like now and then, then kind of elements throughout, and yeah, it kind of, I kind of it's based off um, these uh, YouTubers that go into a cavern um, and end up yeah all brutally murdered by some creatures in this cavern. Yeah. Hell yeah, it's really good. If if film and TV has taught me anything, it's never to go into a dark cave. D no, I mean unless I'm packing a, an arsenal on my back, you know, with all kinds of weaponry. Do not go into the darkness. It is a bad <laughs> time. Could be a good time. You could be. Know. You don't know. It could be. If it, it says free be. candy with an arrow, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, come on. Depends on the candy. Like if there's some, uh, like a like some Kit Kats or some Snickers, I could be like, yeah, I'll be down. But if it was just like a, like I don't, I don't want to besmirch the good name of a Milky Way, but like I could, I could take or leave a Milky Way. Yeah. I like them, but like it's not at the top of my my food mountain. Very my food mountain is Freddo frogs. Oh, I miss I miss <laughs> caramellos. Yeah, Freddy Frogs and Caramellos, the mini ones though, because then I can eat heaps. And then they and get the, the big one ones yeah. too. And then its guts come out. <laughs> it is kind of morbid when you think about it, isn't it? Like the, the caramello guts just, just oozing ooze, down your chin like, as you, yeah. you enjoy this uh, native creature. Yeah, but that's what you have to do. You have to bite the head off. Anyway, horror podcast. At least the chocolate bars aren't full of chlamydia, so that's nice. But, <laughs> oh, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd hope not. But... Uh, Let's let's shift gears. We're, we're going to keep keep this lens on Australiana, and the way I'm going to go with mine is, I thought we don't get many horror games set in like the Australian outback. You know, nothing that really comes to mind for me. Australia, we make a lot of great games, and we've got a lot of horror uh, quality titles coming out or that have been released. But I thought let's 
let's lean into it. And I started writing it down and then I just realized, oh, I'm just ripping off Wolf Creek. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, let's, whether it be the direct video game adaptation of Mick Taylor's jaunt through through the Australian Outback and, and killing people. But I thought, let's, let's go in the Australian Outback. We don't need to go the backpacker trope. We don't need to lean into that. We're just going to say a, a group of friends are, are traveling through the Australian Outback and... And, you know, let's, the, the, the car breaks down or whatever and then chaos ensues from there, but they get picked up by a, by a friendly local local gentleman who ends up being some kind of serial killer and, and he's chasing you through the outback and, and you've got to try and survive. I'm going to get my fandom out of the way and say that uh, Samara Weaving is doing the motion <laughs> capture work on this, so we're going to play Just the motion one capture. of my favourite final girls. Yeah, she can do no wrong. So uh, Samara Weaving is going to play the hero in this story and yeah you're going to be going to be sort of running around a lot of like stealth based hiding elements so a lot of the game you are sort of weaponless and almost feeling helpless where you're hiding holding your breath so we've got some some uh, mechanics taken from you know recently stuff like until dawn where you got to hold the controller really still so they don't hear you and uh you can use maybe the inbuilt microphone <laughs> in the playstation 5 controller so you got to hold your breath so they can't hear you breathing and, and really lean into that but i thought maybe part way through the game you could sort of flip the script and there's like a couple of scenes or chapters you play where you actually play as mick taylor so you sort of play the hunter and you actually kill some of Samara Weaving's friends as well. And then it sort of might flip back. So you sort of get to experience the, the badness and the bleakness and all that sort of visceral trauma and then finish it off. So you get like the opening with the, the helpless individuals, middle piece with the with the, the killer and the big bad. And then it ends by you get jumping into Samara Weaving and she gets that hero moment and finishes him off or doesn't i don't know does she survive i don't know maybe maybe there's no good ending in this one but uh give me like a survival horror game out in the australian outback a lot of silence a lot of just void crickets voidness out there darkness yeah like just that and then like you can hear mick taylor's very oh maybe i can't keep using mick taylor i'm gonna get sued by <laughs> wolf creek here so uh you know Australian serial killer X out there with just talking to himself and, and oh. firing off guns and all that kind of stuff as you're hiding in a bush, you know, holding your breath. So give me, whether it be first or third person, I'm not too upset about that, but definitely, uh, yeah, it starts helpless. You get some serial killer control and then jump back into into sort of the, the survivor's shoes and, and see it play out from there. So give me some Australian outback horror yes. with, with that sort of mechanic. Please and thank you. Because it's already horrifying enough as it is, the Outback, to be honest. Very barren, yeah. Like how exactly. desolate it is. Oh, no, no thanks. <laughs> Plot twist, you just get bitten by a spider or a snake and that's the end. <laughs> and die. <laughs> I thought there's a scene where you sort of maybe got to swim, like s- quietly, stealthily no. swim through like a, a little riverbed no. and there's like crocodiles no. in there no. and stuff like that. No. <laughs> but also that it'd be living out my dream of potentially being killed by a crocodile and going out. Dream? Really <laughs> uh, it's a thing that I just said it off cuff once to, I think it was to Dylan Blight at Explosion Pod, that I really wouldn't mind if that's how I went. Though. You gotta yeah. go spin around but, for yeah, a bit. Yeah, because it you with the death rolls and. <laughs> I'll hold my breath. It's fine. <laughs> would you prefer? Would you prefer to go the way of like a, yeah, a prolonged drowning slash slow consumption by a crocodile, or would you want like a big great white shark just insta bite potentially dead then and there? Well, it's always been crocodiles. Like I like apex okay. creatures. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know. I just said it was just off the cuff, and now it's just like a thing I tell everyone. <laughs> It is great, and I, I do love crocodiles. And it would be a very metal way to go, it's but it'd also be yeah. slow and drawn out. Yeah, I mean, it'd be a really good story for future generations to tell people. Like, my great grandmother was death rolled by a crocodile. Yeah, and and there's <laughs> there's the movie or the biopic off the back of it's exactly. called Death Roll. Oh, my family would make so much money. I should do them a favor. <laughs> no, I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Goodness gracious! But I, I think we've uh. We've got three very unique gaming concepts there. We yeah. just need to start pitching this to the re- uh, respective developers out there and, and see if there's an appetite for these three games. Uh, maybe we've got a fourth here about uh, crocodile swimming survival across- and, <laughs> and swimming whatnot across as well. Creeks. <laughs> Could be really simple. It's like oh, yeah. the New Age Frogger. You've got to swim across the creeks and avoid well, no, getting the, attacked by crocodiles. Or, you know, it could be global. Hit. You go to America and then you've got alligators. But they're not that scary, <laughs> the alligators in America. Yeah, they're a bit weak. 
Yeah. They will go through the Nile, the big Nile crocodile. Yeah, those are scary. As well. I mean, like, in Australia, our crocodiles are, like, 10 foot long. They're big. So it's yeah, like, they're, they're, they're the biggest. <laughs> the big Aussie salties. Mm. So uh, four games there. Listeners, what do you think? Let us know uh, on our four, f- our four potential games. We haven't named them. Maybe we'll workshop some names yeah. um, <laughs> offline and, and, and chuck it out there and see what everyone reckons. But uh, we're going to jump into the second segment. And I wanted to know or ask, what's your favorite horror video game or movie or TV show that you love that is pretty much universally hated? So uh, I can see a bit of bleed from both your respective lists here. So Kat, did you want to start us off on some of the the games, films, TV shows that uh, you're a big fan of that uh, the rest of the internet is usually not? Uh, The Saw movies, because I know a lot of people go for one and two, and then that's it. But I love every single one of them. Um, I, uh, Because I examine movies through a sociological lens, because that's just how my brain works. And so I like to watch them all for, like, this punishment element and how people think they're allowed to punish others for things that they think are morally, uh, you know, what's the... Apprehensible? Apprehensible, yeah. And so I kind of find that 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 framing very interesting you know and how each person is punished accordingly to the things that they've done and freddy vs jason i don't care what anybody says um i see a lot of hate for this movie but it's so freaking good That's the what soundtrack's we amazing <laughs> the soundtrack was amazing yeah it's yeah. So one of the good. best soundtracks in film Agreed. it is so great yeah i put it on in the car and i'm like oh this movie is excellent. And also, I just really love Freddy, and I'm not a fan of, like, the Friday 13th uh, franchise at all. Like, just take it or leave it. I don't care. But uh, Nightmare on Elm Street is just, yeah, pin- the pinnacle of, like, slasher films for me. And some of the one-liners that Freddy gets in Freddy vs. Jason are just unbeatable. They're just, ah, uh, chef's kiss. <laughs> yeah, he's, it's... I, I'm a fan, like... The Saw movies, definitely the early ones, uh, where where my my love for that franchise exists. The latter ones, you can take it or leave it for me. And and I'm not even going to talk about Jigsaw. My goodness gracious, that movie. <laughs> anyway, anyway. But Freddy vs. Jason, I'm firmly in that camp as well. It's great. Seeing two horror heavyweights somehow come together and not only uh, as rivals and try and, you know, kill and outdo each other, but then also the, the generic teenage groups that are getting slaughtered along the way <laughs> it, it shouldn't work but it does like it's it's one of the better friday the 13th slash nightmare on elm street movies in their respective franchises mm. and by a wide it's just, like i know it's a low bar there is some great <laughs> films early in both of those franchises but some of the other ones are just rough as sandpaper but this one's great and it's fun and yeah i think the soundtrack just elevates it to for the yeah. cult status for me yeah Miss Hart, what what do you want to want to add to this? Because I see you've got some some bleed over, and I know you two are both two of the biggest Saw fans that I know <laughs> yeah, in like, my respective s- orbit. Saw grabbed me because I did love these kind of you know comparisons on how their torture or how their puzzle was you know connected to their punishment or their lack of appreciation for life. And then obviously, like we kind of just drifted away from that concept later on in the movies, but it didn't matter because I still loved the puzzle solving and like the mystery and the twists and the turns that kind of happened in it. And yeah, it got a bit cheesy, but it was my cheese and I love it. Um, it, it was, it was my cheese. It was my cheese. <laughs> Hands off my cheese. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't seen spiral. Um, it's okay. Um, or whatever. I enjoyed it. It's all right. Yeah. Well, the, they're talking about the, another Saw movie coming yeah. out soon. That so. old mate's coming back. Yeah. Yeah, he's coming back. It's like, come on. What do you mean, come on? <sighs> I don't, like, Let him work. Let him do his thing. <laughs> I don't think he can do anything else. <laughs> yeah, he, that, that's all he really does. And, and power yeah. to him. They, they're getting blood out of that stone again in, in a very host of creative ways, no doubt. But I'm, I'm going to gonna step back. I'm not going to besmirch yeah. anyone's cheese. <laughs> this is not the place to, yeah. uh, <laughs> to, 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 be one to shit on Saw. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll lose this fight, but... Uh, yeah, the n- no more of this Chris Rock world that they've got going on. It was, it was tough sledding. My God, that was a movie that uh, I-, I walked out of the cinema going, hmm, "Do I ask them for my money back on this one?" But uh, <laughs> I did not. But a movie's a movie, and I'll still uh, respect the art. That's fair. Speaking of a movie's a movie, uh, Hostel Two. 
that is a movie. It, it 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 is a movie, and I freaking love it for this like this character who you think is like going to be this damsel in distress, and you know, and then just the final moments where she's just like fuck yeah, and like just turns the table, and it just becomes this oh like powerful being amongst these dickheads um and it's gory as hell um and i just liked how it was a continuation of the hostel franchise and yeah i I thought it was great not a lot of people don't like it but i i I still enjoy it with hostel one there was some there was some shocking moments in that one as there was in number in number one it made me scared to go to Europe watching these two movies. Uh, I was very yeah, I hesitant never to, to travel. You know, I'm like, I ain't going to any 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 country outside of Australia for a while because I'm scared I'm going to get abducted and have my Achilles cut open in in mm-hmm. some very visceral ways. But uh, they're great films. Uh, was was Eli, Eli Roth did number two as well, didn't he? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think he was attached to it some way. The weird thing for me is the guy at the end, I don't know if I'm doing like a spoiler thing here, but the the male character that you follow and you think you pity and then he does like a like a change and then he gets his comeuppance. He did the song for Hercules, Disney's Hercules. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> There's your little fact. <laughs> um, I love that for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, um, but uh, yeah, it's a great movie. Oh, and um, uh, one of the characters from the Harry Potter movie, the Goblet, the when the, all the schools come together, Crum, Victor Crum, that's him in Hostel too. Oh, okay. There you go, Victor Crum. He's he's a big, big, good-looking European boy. He's a good-looking, yeah, yeah. Oh. But um, yeah, there you go. There you that's go. Cat, have you got any any sort of What's your stance on the Hostel films? Um, are, are you a fan? I'm not a fan of Eli Roth, so that's my okay. issue. <laughs> he can be a bit of a dick. Uh, he, yeah, just some of the things that have come out over the last few years about his like sexism and the way that he treats people on set has mm-hmm. made it a quite complicated relationship for me with his films. Um, as much as, yeah, I, like I've watched them. Um, I enjoyed Hostel 2 a lot more than Hostel 1. Um the it's felt felt like there was like more of a narrative built in Hostel Two, um, I, I agree. a lot more interesting. One felt like gratuitous violence, but yeah. that's just because I'm I will read extreme horror. I'm not a big fan of watching extreme horror, but I appreciate it for what it is. Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. It's interesting. I'm I'm with. I can understand where you're coming from regarding the the extreme violence, where it's easier to read than to see because. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on how your mind works and how it's wired, I guess, because some people, I guess, prefer to maybe soften it in their imagination through the words as opposed to seeing it represented on screen or vice versa. But, um, yeah, I, I don't mind the hostile movies. I, I appreciate them for what they are. Yeah, Eli Roth being a bit of a dickhole is, is another another debate, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but it, then it gets into that whole art versus artist type of discussion as well and, and where can you sort of divide, divide that topic. But... Uh, yeah, it's. I don't think we'll ever get a third one, and I'm yeah. not too sad about that. Like he's got his stuff on Shutter now, where you know horror histories or whatever it is. And yeah, I've just sort of lost lost touch with with him and what he does. But uh, Hostel, I think, was peak for 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 his cinema cinema career. They did do one. There is a third there one. There is another one. Yeah. God damn. Okay. It's it's not hmm. great. It's like so, well, that's like, why. Th- there we go. <laughs> yeah, like so. <laughs> it's like some weird thing where it's like a. I think it's like a Bucks party or some shit. I don't know. Oh. Interesting concept. At a hostel. Yeah, it's, it's weird, but yeah. I think that was the last one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've got no desire to watch the third yeah. one. If, if it pops up one day and I've got literally nothing else to watch, maybe I'll watch Only it. Only reason why I watched it. <laughs> 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 My watch list is way too long for me to be putting Hostel 3 in there. <laughs> <laughs> just put, it, it, the put the it in the rotation, it just comes up. It's like, and root oh. again. Oh, no. <laughs> no, thanks. No, that's <laughs> all right. And you got a couple of games here you wanted to highlight as well there, Ali. Question marks, though, um, <laughs> because I wrote Fatal Frame 2 Crimson. Like, I, it wasn't hated, I don't think, but it also wasn't very well known. I like. I feel like it's a pretty niche horror game, so not a lot of people knew about it, um, but it's one that I love. It's one that's kept the shit out of me. Um, and then I wrote Heavy Rain Horror? Question mark. Um, it's more of a thriller but you know there's moments in it so i just wrote that (laughs) 
because no one seems to like heavy rain now. Yeah, I I didn't mind heavy rain. Fatal Frame Two, I really enjoyed it. I'm I'm with you where it's maybe not universally hated, but it's not universally acknowledged to the degree it should be. Yeah. Like uh, it doesn't doesn't get talked about in the same same breath as some of your more mainstream gaming franchises. Yeah. There, um, hmm, I, that whole horror versus thriller debate. What what's your stance on that? Because I know it can be divisive for some people where. Some like they have to almost silo them off. It's like no, they can't coexist. I'm like of course they can. Yeah. There's, there's beats in both that can lean into genres and bleed across. Cat, as the uh, the more the more uh, acclaimed, I guess, uh, person in, in media here amongst the three of us. Uh, what's what's your stance on that? Have you got any hard and fast rules that you follow nah. in in that regard? Absolutely not. Um, I find that film elitists and gatekeepers have a tendency to do that, but. Um, I love thrillers. I love psychological thrillers. I think that they're more horror than people give them credit for. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I don't see why not. It's it's silly to, to say, oh, no, that can't fit into that genre. It needs to be on its own. No, thrillers, uh, I think it's, you know, you've got your horror umbrella and you have so many things that go underneath that. And, um yeah, I don't say anything isn't a horror. If if the director or the writer says this is a horror movie, then that's what I'm going to take it as. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's their work. I like the the horror the horror umbrella metaphor there because yeah. you need that when there is heavy rain about. Because hey. So uh, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> there's there's certain elements and tropes of all genres that can then bleed under that or. or stay dry under that horror umbrella, I guess, if we're going to keep leaning into that there. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with, with your, your games, uh, your games and films that you've mentioned on the Freddy vs. Jason or Friday the 13th universe discussion. I wanted to quickly throw in Jason X because it sucks, (laughs) but it sucks so bad that it's like comedically good. Obviously this is where, where they've cryogenically frozen Jason (laughs) Voorhees because he keeps killing people back on earth in, you know, current day. And then, (laughs) For some reason, they've, they've transported him out into, like, this base out in space. And he, as, as is tradition in a horror movie, somehow he gets unfrozen and chaos ensues and death is everywhere <laughs> and so is space sex for some reason. There's a lot of sex going on in this movie hmm. in Zero-G and, in and, space, and just in space do? in general. And, um, yeah, Jason Voorhees in space killing people is something that... I never knew that I'd want in my life, but uh, the few times I've watched it, I'm like, you know what? I don't regret this 90-odd minutes of shit that I've just waded through, and um, it's just so dumb that it works. Have you guys watched Jason X? Yeah, I think it was one of my first Jason films I ever watched. Oh, I think <laughs> I feel like Jason X was one of those like um, movies that are playing in a party, like, you know, it's just always in the background, so I feel like I've kind of watched it, but not directly watched it. Yeah, you, you probably got out of it lucky doing it that way because yeah, uh, it, it's like when you know when people say don't stare at the sun, it can hurt your eyes. That's probably a bit of this movie. <laughs> like it is, it's not a good time, but it kind of is in a guilty just guilty it's a mess pleasure, yeah. type yeah. of way. And the other other film I wanted to highlight is the Return of the Living Dead, where they sort of lean more into the the comedic zombie tropes. And I know Cat, we've sort of just confirmed earlier that, that zombies is sort of the the bugbear and the bane of your existence. Uh, so I'm sorry to bring this up. Might be might be a delicate uh, talking point here, but yeah, Return of the Living Dead, loved it solely off the back of the this movie that coined you know the the whole brains you know zombies needing to eat brains trope. This is what this uh, that came from was this movie in the 80s and the fact that they sort of more lean into the lighter tone of of horror and just whimsicalness with with zombies. Uh, was just something that checked the box for me for this movie. Like, I don't know if they intentionally tried to make it comedic in some parts. Like, it felt like they tried to deliver a fairly serious movie, but there is just funny things with <laughs> limbs getting cut off and the way they move around and, yeah, the brains and all that. Oh, yeah. But I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I actually yeah. don't mind that, that, that fran- like, the whole Living Dead franchise. So there are some zombie movies I really enjoy. Um, and then there are others that absolutely terrify me. So okay. um, I watched... you've got to, you've got to outline these lists. So yeah. let's go with the enjoyed zombie list first. Then we'll jump into okay. the terrifying. Uh, Shaun of the Dead, was, yep. Um, yep. Night of the Living Dead, uh, anywhere thing where zombies are slow 
And I know that mm-hmm. a lot of people um, are more scared of the slow zombies because of the overwhelming, like, they just, you know, come over and there's just, like, so many of them stumbling around. But running zombies terrify me. So when they remade Dawn of the Dead um, and they were running, I was, I think I was, like, 13 when that came out and we watched it and I was like, absolutely not. No. How did you go with, um like, 28 days and 28 yeah, weeks later? Because that me. was my first, like... Mm-mm. interaction with with fast swift zombies and that was scary as shit yeah that and war of the worlds where they're like piling up yep oh, yes. no no thanks <laughs> i just too think quick, too quick they shouldn't exactly be that's they're the dead. problem yeah and then they should get exhausted too because what are they running on like nothing really they're so not they shouldn't eating, be that fast so yeah. i don't know there's a flaw contradictory to me it is interesting, the science behind it, because a lot of them are by then sometimes like devoid of blood. So mm-hmm. how is the blood pumping the muscles for them to move so fast? They should be stumbling What's going around. on here? Scientists? We need to we need Oh, Mythbusters. We need the Mythbusters yeah. on this to confirm if this is technically oh. possible. Yeah, I don't want scientists to figure it out because then they'll figure out how to make zombies and then no, we're thanks. all screwed. Yeah. Then we're all screwed. No. Yeah. Mythbusters. But... Uh, yeah, I, I, is Mythbusters still... They're not really, are they? No. I don't know what I they're doing. Know. They're kind of doing their own things. Oh, okay. But a Halloween edition of Mythbusters would be cool. Mm. Yeah, I want them to debunk this this zombie thing as mm. far as how fast could they move? What's the what's the science behind that? So, Muscle uh, deterioration, and, like no protein. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if there's some science behind them eating brains that that's what actually makes them more intelligent too. They're not smart though. <laughs> They're literally brain dead. <laughs> well, if they eat all the brains, maybe that in like enhances their grey matter and, and their you intelligence. You can basically level. get your know. knowledge. <laughs> ah, yes. Planet Terror, one of the best zombie films of all time. See, I, I will love stand Planet by that. Terror. Yeah. Fantastic movie. It is, it is my favourite of that double feature. Yeah. Like Death Proof is great, but Planet Terror is yeah. something else. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm also going to highlight a game. It was tough. I was trying to think of video game horror titles that that i enjoy that that the world hates and for the most part i think the games that the world hates i hate but uh (laughs) the one that i wanted to highlight was a game i played in 2000 which came out on playstation one called resident evil survivor and they they sort of flipped the script on this one where it went like um point blank or time crisis style we actually had the the light gun controller and you got to shoot zombies and lickers and things like that as they come onto the screen and it was funny because when the game first came out it didn't wasn't actually bundled with the gun controller so you had to try and play it on the on the like on the 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 playstation controller itself which sucked but i actually imported a light gun from the united states and it actually looked like a like a, a real like glock um, video game controller and the first time I imported it in Australian Customs actually seized it and wouldn't let me have it so I got it on the second go around and playing this game and standing in front of the telly from like a meter and a half away shooting my little light gun at um, at lickers and zombies w- was great the game sucked but um, I'm a Resident Evil tragic so I'm going to sort of look past the game kind of sucking and just think no one ever asked for this but it somehow worked and it sort of uh, scratched a niche for me in 2000 playing Resident Evil Survivor. Have you guys seen or heard of this little, well, not really gem, I don't know what you classify it as, <laughs> but uh, this entry into the the long, long-running long Resident Evil universe? I think I've seen screenshots. Like, I think I've seen, like, kind of mentions, especially when it comes to, like, lists of Resident Evil games. Yeah. So, but, yeah, never played it. Okay. You're not missing out on much, but uh, <laughs> that was the closest <laughs> I could find to a video game that I, that you know, most... Uh, most of the world panned, but I thought it was actually passable. So uh, I'll throw yeah. that one in there. I've, I've got a quick question. We didn't sort of really vet this one. Just a quick rapid fire. It could be simply a no from us all here. But uh, do you have any Halloween-based traditions? So uh, anything, you know, Halloween is obviously a yearly thing that rolls out at the back end of October. Is there something or maybe like there's a movie you have to watch every year or a snack you have to eat or whatever? Like, have you got any traditions that you have to follow every year when it comes to Halloween? Not really, but I do celebrate. My family um, are from Scotland. And so, like, my dad and I will always send, like, a, you know, a happy Sarwin message because, like, our family would have been celebrating back in the day. Um, Other than that, I just trick-or-treat and I always have, like, 
uh, candy here because I always have trick-or-treaters that come past. Um, this year I've actually made up like uh, trick-or-treat bags for my senior like senior classes. <laughs> so great. So it's got like great. candy and stuff in them because I have them first period on Monday. So I thought that it'd be nice for them, make them feel special. Um, other than that, my year is like Halloween all year round like my life so it, <laughs> it doesn't really you know make that much of a difference it being halloween mm-hmm. yeah you just embody halloween yeah 24 7 365 basically yeah what about what about you ali like you're in the the halloween super fandom country like you know america gets so far behind halloween and, oh, and yeah. the theatrics behind it and the trick-or-treating and the parties like I've been over there during Halloween and people like dress up like for like week, like a whole week leading up and bleeding past that where there's parties and events and all kinds of insanity attached to Halloween. And I love that the whole, the whole country embraces it, but have you um, either had any longstanding Halloween traditions or a few maybe that you've adopted since you've uh, moved over there? So the funny thing is, is back in, when I lived in Australia, our house was like, we don't celebrate Halloween. It's an American thing. We don't celebrate it. So we were the house that had like a piece of paper on the door saying, we don't celebrate. Like, hope you have a good night. Be safe. But yeah, we don't celebrate. Like that was how it was in Australia. Um, I never trick or treated. Well, I think I did once for a girl's party or something like that. But that was it. Um, So it was kind of like no Halloween over here. Then I moved to the United States. Uh, and then I, I now have a yearly Halloween party that gets hosted every, every year. So we do that and it's dress up competitions and there's like prizes that they hand out and everything. And it's a lot of fun. Um, and then, uh, I, new tradition is, um, uh, a mutual friend of mine and my husband's, uh, they love Halloween, um, and they go all out in the house. They bought that giant skeleton. Um, yes at Home Depot. So they've got the giant skeleton and everything. It's all inflatables and everything at the front, like a lot um, from the Haunted Mansion in Disneyland, like a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, And so we dress up and we go there to their house and we hand out candy to kids while we're drinking and eating at the, on the, at the front patio kind of thing. So that's become the tradition now since moving here. So I went from, no, we don't celebrate it to just amongst and, now yearly things that i expect for halloween now so it's pretty fun because i love dressing up i love dress up so that's so great like i do get envious like australia's starting to turn a a corner slowly every year i think where halloween is becoming a little bit more well not accepted but like it's becoming more common like i remember growing up as a kid you'd see a couple of kids in your street maybe dress up and knock on the doors and a lot of families were like you know this we don't celebrate how like like what you said earlier. It's like that's that's yeah. not our thing. But now you're seeing like hordes and hordes of, of kids walking the streets on 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 Halloween night asking for kids and uh, asking for treats and, and dressed up and and it's great to see. So I mean I'm very appreciative that we're starting to as is tradition in Australia. You know we follow a lot of things that America does and and this is one great one that that's awesome to see us becoming more accepting of and becoming yeah. part of our. Uh, our special days, our, our calendar days. So, uh, yeah, I we, I don't really have any traditions either. We were talking before we started recording about, do I need to get some candy yeah. in case some kids come trick-or-treating? But because I'm He's in like a, a, a group of five <laughs> oh. townhouses, there's a gate. So I'm like, do I open the gate to allow them to come in? Stand at the gate. Maybe. maybe. Then I might have to run into one of my neighbours because I don't like them. So oh, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? May, maybe I could do like by the... You know, the the plastic pumpkin and put all the candy in it at, at the front of yeah. the gate so they can sort of just have a bit of an honour system because uh, it's nice to keep those traditions alive. Honest yeah, some of the kids will just take work. all the candy. Just like be but... honest on like a little spike. And like and then just put a fake webcam, not plugged in, but just put a webcam like right there <laughs> yeah. so they think someone's watching. <laughs> We're watching you. <laughs> One thing um, that I do do with my nieces is explain to them what Halloween meant to our ancestors so that they don't think that it is an American holiday. So I've kind of explained that in America they capitalised on this like yep. really cool idea and they made it this really big thing. But in our family, it, you know, celebrated the end of harvesting and, you know, also that our pagan ancestors would have celebrated like this thin veil between living and dead and they would go around trying to protect 
protect each other in costumes and singing songs and that's where all these traditions came from. So making sure that they just understand the history of it's really important for, for me with my nieces. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I think that's great. Otherwise, yeah, like you said, if, if we can commercialize any type of holiday it. and monetize <laughs> it to the umpteenth degree, you're damn well right that society's <laughs> going to do that. So, uh, yeah, no, knowing the origins of, of Halloween and, and you know, where it came from in, in respective countries is, is certainly key. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's, that's cool to see. But, yeah, no, no traditions, but I might buy some candy. Yeah. Um, I might leave out some Milky Way because I saw Ali shoot daggers at me when I uh, talked it down, not being on sort of the the god tier of candy. So maybe I'll maybe I'll buy some of those in little fun packs or fun size fun packs size, that they do at yeah. Woolies and do what I can. But uh, let's jump into segment three, and I thought we'd give our respective top five video game horror franchises. Uh, Kat, did you want to lead us off? I can see looking at our three lists and even the uh, the list from some of the polling we did with the broader 8-Bit Nation and the video game and, and culture community, uh, there, there's similarities across all four of these lists. So it, it seems we all have very impeccable taste, I must say. I but uh, yeah, um, give, us, give us your top five. Uh, so I have Silent Hill. Um, not only is it uh, one of my favourite movie franchises yes. uh, and like just one of those nostalgia franchises that I can just watch for the for the sake of it because I just love it so much. The, the I don't know which version it is. It might just be the original on PlayStation 2 was uh, something that my friends and I played through when we were about 15. So we all gathered on our couch at one of my houses and we sat and played through the whole thing in just like one day. Like we even like went into the night and so we would like swap the controller around because we just wanted to finish this game. And it was just like a really cool memory that I have of, of playing that game. Yeah, It's a great, it's a great game. It's a very special franchise, and I like that you you showed a bit of love to to the films as well, because yeah. obviously <laughs> we've got another one in the works yes. after last week with the the Silent Hill uh, showcase, yeah. where we've we've been pining for Silent Hill for for many many moons, and lo and behold, we've just got more Silent Hill than we can poke a stick at now. So uh, yeah, everybody is happy. I've got Silent Hill on my list, and uh, Miss Hart's got Silent Hill mm-hmm. on her list as well. I don't know, because we've got some, some bleed over here, did we want to sort of say where they slotted in or did you want to add some more talk to Silent Hill now, Miss Hart? Oh, I'll just add, like, um, Silent Hill out of the... I'm going to call them the main two. Um, Silent Hill is the better one for me because um, I also include PT and in Silent Hill on, in that little bracket. So PT yeah. was great. Damn shame that we never got the full thing of that. So, um, And, yeah, the movie is just fucking great. So <laughs> love that movie. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Like, um, it's it's very it's a great franchise. Just like one of the other franchises that I love and, and got in my list is you know it's it's the warring cousin of Resident Evil for the most part. They sort of get compared in in similar similar breaths and Capcom versus Konami, so on and so forth. And but they're uneven. You know, there's some great titles in both, and then there's some some weaker titles in both. But uh, I'm excited to see what they do with this this. Um, remake of number two i'm very excited to see what they do for this next film um entry in the franchise because they it was one of the few video game adaptations to screen that they they stayed very true to the source material and they respected the tone and the visuals was phenomenal and i'll never forget seeing someone's skin get ripped off and thrown against a church and the wall scene with the like, head and the barbed wires and stuff like that also, kind of coming in it was like that was so cool i just want to Heaps of oh, sexy yeah. pyramid heads with his butt. Shots. Yeah, that's all I want. He is my There's husband. Plenty of though. that. There's plenty of sexy pyramid heads on the internet. You just chuck that no. in the search engine. No, no. I'm because I'm going to get ones I don't want to see, and then I'm never going to see it. <laughs> okay, okay. You, you give me give me a list of sexy pyramid head criteria, and okay. I'll do the searching for you, Fantastic. and then I'll share the appropriate links. <laughs> all right. So, um, give us the give us the rest of your top five here. Kat, so you've got Silent Hill at number one. What comes in at number two? I have Until Dawn, but I also want to include The Quarry in that because they're the only ones that I've played from Supermassive Games. I do have the Dark Pictures Anthology. I just haven't started it yet. I haven't really had time over the last couple of months to get into those, but I really want to um, because I really want to play... uh, What's the Ashes one? House of Ashes. House of Ashes. I really want to play that because it uh, looks so cool. I've seen people play Man of Medan, so I'm kind of like, oh, maybe fatigued of that game 
Uh, but yeah, I really like the Supermassive games um, and the stuff that they have done in the horror space because of their choice systems and um, their like collection hunting and whatnot is really cool, the way that they've integrated that. And their monsters are just freaking The Windigo awesome. great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's... I kind of want to slap myself in the face looking at these lists and like realizing because Until Dawn's one of my favorite games of all time <laughs> and Supermassive games, I love what they do. The Quarry, phenomenal. Like I think all three of us on the call here yeah. mm-hmm. had an awesome time with The Quarry and, uh, you know, it's it's tropey and pulpy and all the best uh, things from that sort of 80s slasher period. But it's not on my list and I feel like an idiot <laughs> Maybe it's because I do have a little bit of bad taste in my mouth from like Man of Medan and Little Hope. House of Ashes, though, really good. Like, I really enjoyed it. Ali and I played a little bit uh, co op together and, and experienced oh, a bit of that game. Yeah. And um, yeah. it was a uh, ton well, of fun. I, I wrote Until Dawn and I'm like, do I write the anthology? I'm like, no, I'm just going to write Until Dawn because <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not big on some <laughs> of the other ones. Because Until Dawn is where they. they they established themselves. They did it right. They, they've done it so far the best. I still think Until Dawn's better than The Quarry. But, yeah, like, I just feel like, yeah. like that's the one. That was the pinnacle. And I guess that's, that's like, the, the, they're going to constantly be reaching for, I feel, which sucks. But, yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny. They sort of, uh, they, they peaked they peaked early, old Supermassive, and now they're trying to do what they can yeah. to get back to the heights of Until Dawn. Yeah. You know, like, Rami Malek is in it. Yeah. Hayden Panettiere's in Until Dawn. Like, the the cast is phenomenal and I love it so much. I just hate myself a little bit right now for not even having (laughs) it on my list. So, uh, boo me for disrespecting a game and a franchise that I obsess over. So, uh, I need to really evaluate my life choices after this podcast because I've made a bad one today. All right, you're number three, Kat. What you got for us? I have Bioshock, which, besides Silent Hill, was, like, the first horror game I ever really played and played through the entire franchise. Uh, Because with horror games, if I don't get hooked in, like, the first hour, I will abandon it and leave it. It's that simple. Um, I did it with Alien Alien Isolation. Um, I got stuck somewhere, and then I was like, fuck it, I'm not finishing the rest of this. (gasps) I know. Go back. I can't. Go back now. now. I can't. (laughs) I'm like at a stalemate with it. <laughs> but um, Bioshock, I absolutely adore. I even went through a period where I was cosplaying as a little sister uh, before I got all my tattoos. So <laughs> it was a lot easier then to to cover whatever I had. Um, but yeah, I absolutely love the series. I love the writing. I love the tone. Um, I love things very uh, dystopian. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a freaking awesome series. It really is, and it's it's on my list. Uh, I'm I'm a big Bioshock tragic. Like uh, when when they sort of released that first game in 2007, it was very very special, very unsettling, very gorgeous at the same time. And I love when games or or just media in general can sort of tread that line between stunning and grotesque and and creepy. And and this game does it better than the, than most. And and obviously Bioshock Two and then Infinite following in the calendar release cycle. Really great games. I'm very excited to see what happens when this finally does get brought to screen, mm. small or big, if it's done with respect and, and showing that high level of polish that these games have. I have a little bit of hesitancy there that it will not meet that uh, expectation that I've set for myself. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very special and it's one of the best stories in, in video games and especially one of the best stories in, in horror and uh, yeah, it's well worth your time. And the fact that the original was so heavily done by, uh, you know, the, the then 2K team here in Australia is also testament. Like, uh, you know, seeing these Aussies kick goals in that space yeah. is also great. And yeah, I am i can't wait for the inevitable Bioshock 4 or whatever they do because uh, it is it is a money earner for them, but it's also a story that is very rich and deep and begging to be mined and explored in more detail and and just those first experiences with the splices or meeting (laughs) a big daddy and and it's it's so creepy and beautiful and i love 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 bioshock yeah it's fantastic i um the first time i ran into a splicer i think i squealed and threw my controller but (laughs) yeah a reasonable response right (laughs) yeah justified more than justified (laughs) I still think you need to go back and check out Alien Isolation, oh. though, because it's the best <laughs> alien game in alien game history. Are you sure I did play Alien Fireteam? <laughs> 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 
I need to go have a shower hearing that. So, ugh, I played co-op um, with my partner because we couldn't see each other. So it was just something we did every night was just play through co-op while we chatted yeah. to each other. It was it was nice. It's it's fine. It's fun. It was fun. Yeah. I didn't yeah, play the story just... campaign, so I don't know what that was about. <laughs> I think there's a story in there. there I've played it through and I'm just like... <laughs> I've heard on the grapevine there's a story. <laughs> You're number four on your list here, though, Kat. It interests me quite a bit to see this on the list. Uh, Control. Yes. Um, it scared me, this game. Uh, it was super creepy. Um, I don't know if it's meant to be a horror game, but being alone in some of the, the levels that you're going through and um, just, like, uh, the sound design, uh, the lighting, everything, it just it terrified me. And then there were, like, those creepy... Um, transition uh, stages where you play to learn like new skills and stuff. Those were creepy too. It it is very, it's a very unsettling game, mm. and it's very unique amongst our list here. I think <laughs> like uh, like Remedy knocked it out of the park, and then somehow connecting this universe into Alan Wake is just Pretty something cool, that made my mind go <laughs> yeah. when that was all confirmed. But the the fact that it's you know. Twin Peaksy X Filesy goodness in a video game, yeah. like well, give me give me more of this, please. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the combat's fun. Yeah, the you know the the weapons and the evolutions of the weapons and stuff. It's really cool and it's very slick. Like it is a stunning game, and and seeing those sort of dreamscape esque universes and and seeing just the world evolve and change around you in parts of it, it is a bit creepy, but yeah. it's also beautiful. And those, like, monsters that... No, well, not monsters. It was just, like, black outlines that would be on, like, chessboards or whatever. Look, it's been a really long time since I've played it. They freaked me out. No. Nah. Rightfully so. Yuck. Oh, don't do Imagine that. Imagine if that was zombies. No! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But on the topic of zombies, I see your number five <laughs> is a fantastic franchise. I Dead Rising, because it's just one of those franchises that is just so stupid. And um, I actually started working at, well, working for a company that distributed Capcom around the time that Dead Rising 3 was announced. Uh, or Dead Rising, Dead Rising 2 or 3? The one where they, they announced it at E3, where it's the guy on his iPod and he's like running down the street. And uh, we actually did get to play a demo of that that same year. And it was just ridiculously fun. Like, it's so stupid, and, like, if you don't like it, that's fine. But it's dumb. Dumb Dumb fun. It is dumb fun. Ali, did you play much Dead Rising over the years? I I can't remember which ones I've played. (laughs) I I just, I think it's, like, always, like, just a blanket kind of thing. And I'm just like, I know I've played it, but... (laughs) I just don't know which one. (laughs) They they all kind of, they all kind of blend in together. Because it is just... I just realised I had, um... I had the Dead Rising and the Dead Island 2 trailer confused. Dead, oh, Dead Rising okay. 3 I have played. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because Dead Rising 3 was sort of the the Xbox exclusive yeah. for a while. Yeah. That's, That's what yeah, I had which was a Which was a good sell point. Yeah, because the weapons on that are so good. <laughs> yeah. So Dead Rising, you can combine all types of household items to make all kinds of death machines. It's so good. Set in third person. <laughs> The first couple of games, well, the few of the games you're playing, I always forget his name, the private investigator slash journalist, whatever his name is. You play him and and you're running, like the first one where where you're trapped in that mall is absolutely absurd and hyper-violent and gory, but also funny. And I liked in in that world, in the first one, especially where it was time-based. So if, if you didn't do things in a certain time frame, characters that are part of the story would actually die and, mm. and the story would pivot and adjust accordingly if you could, you know, get the cure back to them to to stop the spread of the, the zombie virus amongst their bodies and whatnot. But I just remember riding around on, like, law- right on lawnmowers yeah. and just, like, cutting <laughs> zombies up left, right and centre. And then, like, cars and flying. just, like, doing, That's like, I remember. burnouts a lot of driving. and, like, killing them I all. I just remember it's a lot so of driving. So absurd. Yeah. Um, I have an honourable mention um, because sure. I just remembered I have the remake of The House of the Dead on Switch. Hey. So I recently went to Netherworld in Brisbane and they have a House of the Dead... Um, shoot- Arcade machine in Yes. There. And it definitely reignited my love and hatred for that entire franchise. So I'm looking for It is great. Yeah. But those those arcade shooters, like 
they're, they're dialed up like obviously they're coin eaters is, is yeah. their intention so like it's it's damn near impossible to finish any of these games on a dollar or a two dollar or a token or whatever it whatever it accepts and house of the dead is great and there was some cool moments in there where obviously you can play co-op and got zombies coming at you and other kinds of creepy crawlies but it was nigh impossible to finish yeah. each one of those chapters without feeding some more coins oh, yeah. into that machine because that's how they get you. But as a kid, I was so good at it. And then when I played it at Netherworld, I was like, why can't I get through this thing? <laughs> like, I couldn't even get through, like, the first stage. I was like, I give up. So well, hopefully... now you got it on the Switch. You can practice and refine exactly. those shooting skills. I don't know how it would play going from a from a gun controller to, to joysticks, but I'm sure you'll make it work. We'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. Yeah. It'll be fine. Mm. All right. Well, that's that's a good list. That's a good list. There's, there's some common beats there amongst ourselves here too. But, Ali... Let's, uh, let's jump across to your your top five. Okay, so number one, Silent Hill. We already kind of discussed that. Great. Um, number two is Resident Evil. Like I said, they compete against each other quite a lot and Silent Hill just takes the cake. Number three, Until Dawn. Also said my piece about that. Now, okay, these last two, um, they're either going to be known or not known, so I'm going to have to explain a bit. <laughs> um, the first one, number four, uh, Harvester Games. Harvester Games have made these really brilliant point-and-click adventures, um, one called The Cat Lady, another one called Downfall, and they are these point-and-click adventure, and they're these really brutal stories of characters and, like, being in these – in real world, like, you know, real world stories where it was – like just messed up people and dealing with people. And like the cat lady is about a woman who is given um, the ability to come back to life and she is hit, given the opportunity to kill um, maggots, parasites of the world. So she encounters these horrible human beings and she has to kill them. But the the overall art style is like it's simple, but it is still grotesque. And it's I love the story of it, and I also love the story of Downfall, even though it's a little bit on the sadder side um, and messed up. But yeah, um, so if you're a point and click adventure enthusiast, I recommend as these two in particular. So Cat Lady and Downfall. Um, I'm big. I love point and click adventure, and when I found these two, I was like, this is messed up. Oh, I love it. Um, so, and Cat Lady has a pretty good soundtrack too, and Downfall, but Cat Lady has a pretty okay. good soundtrack as well. So, um, check them out if you like. And the fifth one is called, um, is a studio called Puppet Combo. And they've really been um, establishing themselves, especially in the little horror game indie scene. Um, and the style of games that they make is kind of like a homage to old VHS 80s slashes. And even the graphic style of the game looks like a PlayStation 1 game. Like, But the way that they do horror and they kind of put you as a character in these spaces that you've watched in movies all the time... Um, They've just done it so well and they just keep on just putting out more and more games. And um, if you're a person that kind of follows like the indie horror scene, especially on YouTube, like with the, with the video games, you definitely see them. Um, they've established a name for that. If, if, you know, Puppet Combo has released a game, everyone's on top of it. So um, another one that I recommend. So that was on my fifth place. Ooh, I'm just having a look. These look great. So check them out. I like uh, that you've gone a little little bit left of center there and yeah some of the games that puppet combo have done like here's the the game titles themselves Mm -hmm. babysitter bloodbath nun massacre the power drill massacre Mm -hmm. and the night ripper so yeah and even even the box art like you said it's ripped straight from from the 80s you'd see this on an old video 2000 shelf back in the day or something like that and it's it's awesome so um i haven't played any of the games yet but i've seen a few things here or there online and it's certainly intriguing and appealing i just need to take some time out to, to give one of these a spin maybe the power drill massacre puppet combo games are usually not i'm not going to call them short but they're definitely not like long-winded games so you can definitely play them in a short session and you know get to experience them the cat lady and downfall very long very long okay. great stories and all that sort of stuff but it's a longer game nice nice have you got any honorable mentions you want to throw out there as well in passing here i guess um Crimson Butterfly, uh, Fatal Frame. Um, yeah, because I said no one knew about it and apparently people do. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough people know about it. That's for damn sure. It's it's a great game and or great universe and the whole uh, camera concept is, is awesome. 
and it was one of sort of the pioneers of that in, in horror using using a camera as a, as a weapon and a plot device and uh yeah more of that please all right i'm gonna jump in and my number one to no one's surprise just about i'd say is resident evil is my favorite horror video game franchise Resident Evil 2 and now Resident Evil 2 Remake, I guess if you want to bundle them together, is one of my favorite games of all time. I remember playing the original at the ripe old age of 10 in 1996, getting scared, going down a hallway and having dogs smash through the through the glass, absolutely terrified me. And I still remember certain plot points and scary moments in that game to this day. I don't want to mm-hmm. spoil anything, but... Uh, yeah, it's 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 a great franchise. Yes, it's not without its warts. There is some horrible games in the Resident Evil world, but there's also some absolute gems. And I sort of feel almost like this proud parent moment with Resident Evil these days where it's really returned to form, not only with the remakes, but also what they've done with Seven and now Village, where they've sort of reset the formula and shifted into first person and gone away from the zombie trope and they're mixing in other types of mythologies and creatures and horror concepts and it's really refreshed the Resident Evil palette for me. Like Sadly, what gets translated to the big or the small screen often sucks ass, yep. but uh, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Hopefully we get a decent adaptation one day, but uh, oh. yeah, it certainly is not the most recent uh, Welcome to Raccoon City film or <laughs> the Resident Evil TV series they did with everyone's favourite Lance Reddick because holy moly was that bad. The second game or second franchise in my list that I wanted to shout out is The Last of Us. I think like uh, from a, from a storytelling perspective on my list, especially it's, it's the strongest from a pure narrative standpoint, the story of Ellie and Joel and, and everything that comes, comes with that relationship. And uh, that's, that evolution of those characters across those two games is very special, very memorable. There is some moments in in this franchise that still stays to me to this day as far as shocking, horrific, unsettling, heartbreaking. And when you can weave that into a into a horror game with, with the jump scares and, and the gore and everything else, it's just a big old chef's kiss for me. The third one on my list is a game we're getting a remake of in January, and that is Dead Space. Obviously uh, released originally in 2008, way back when, through EA Redwood's Shores and published by EA, obviously. Fantastic story. Any any type of space game, especially space horror, just immediately uh, grabs my attention. And playing as Isaac Clarke on this uh, decrepit, abandoned Ishimura space station is so creepy and so scary and (sighs) mixing in not only the puzzles but all these nightmare fueled creatures and just the unique ways that if you you know you think okay I'm gonna blow this thing's head off or this legs off whatever like that's not that's not the end these things then will crawl or run at you without the legs or without the head like it's so creepy and the fact that it leans into that sort of body horror angle you don't get a ton of that in video games so shout out to dead space one two and three in that regard i saw some nods as i'm talking dead space here from both yourselves is there anything you wanted to add on the dead space talk we'll throw it over to you first cat um i've tried to play dead space but it scared the living crap out of me so i like (laughs) reverted back to like watching other people play it so i could at least close my eyes play it (laughs) Same. That was that's that yeah. was what my nodding was. Was that like that first instance of like, yeah, I killed that alien. I started walking, and then it was going for me again. No. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't play it. Yeah, so that's I never same. It. <laughs> it's so great, and it's so unsettling, and I'm very excited. Like I know when the the Dead Space remake was announced, uh, you know, in the last twelve months on on the pod here, Ali and I have been a little bit lukewarm on it, but now I'm starting to see trailers and stills from the game. I'm like, okay. I'm in and like what you guys have just both mentioned then I'm going to be very uncomfortable and it's going to be very unsettling but I'm going to force my way through it again and my heart rate on my fantastic new uh, Apple Watch Ultra will be probably saying hey you need to put the controller down Brendan because this is not good for your health Chill out. it is going to be very stressful for me but I'm going to play it in uh, in January but I'm also going to play Callisto Protocol in December mm. Cat, are you going to be jumping in on Callisto Protocol? Um, I don't know yet. 
yet because I haven't found out much. Um, I am super out of the loop in with games, but I'm trying to get back in because we want to start covering games on the website. So um, hopefully I will see how I go. If it makes you feel better, this game is so messed up that Japan has banned it. Oh, I'm in. <laughs> I saw that. I saw that overnight. Yeah, so it's not going to get released in Japan. And, you know, Japan and the Japanese culture and the Japanese people, they love their horror. Yeah. So there's something going on here with the Callisto Protocol for this <laughs> game to be refused refused classification how yeah. is it going First, to get... well, as soon as they found that out i'm like oh is it banned in australia yet? yeah that's <laughs> what i was like japan, are we next if japan said no what did australia say god god we're so ass backwards here you know, the things that get released on television and like in the cinema here and then the games that don't get released still defies logic but uh, we don't need to get on that soapbox again but uh, yeah callisto protocol yeah. in early december I cannot wait for that just to see what uh, what Glenn Schofield's been up to there. And it looks so twisted and warped and just skin crawling that I cannot wait for it. My fourth is Silent Hill. We talked about that a little mm-hmm. earlier. Uh, it was the, the yin to the Resident Evil Yang as far as the, the two big franchises in the late 90s and then into the 2000s there. I'm excited to see what they do with this Silent Hill 2 remake. Just some of the themes and the the imagery of those original games back on the early Sony's that I was playing it on is very unsettling for the time. Even though the graphical like fidelity was not there, there were still moments in that game, especially transitioning from you know normal state to that nightmare hellscape. Mm. Seeing that in the game, and then you're dealing with characters like um, Pyramid Head and, and some of the other yeah, themes. Uh, oh, I yeah. want to talk about it, but I don't want to spoil it. It's just like, holy moly, this is a lot for a game. And I'm in my early teenage years here. This is a lot to try and unpack yeah. and understand <laughs> here. But I really enjoyed it. So I'm keen to see more of Silent Hill over the coming years because we've got about 65 new entries making <laughs> yeah. their way to all kinds of platforms, which is awesome. And then my fifth was Bioshock, which we already talked about. And I wanted to, I still feel bad because I didn't mention Until Dawn. Until Dawn's on my list somewhere, we'll just say somewhere <laughs> in there. But I'm going to go throw an honourable mention to Outlast. No. No. <laughs> because no. it it really took that, like like Ali mentioned Fatal Frame early, it really took that camera mechanic and just ran with it. Or you're running with it in the game yeah. because <laughs> there's no... Like, you're not on the front foot in this game. You've got no weaponry. You're constantly running and hiding, getting chased by all kinds of freaks and the tension of hiding under a bed or in a closet with your video camera on night mode trying to not breathe too much and then you get the low battery flashing on your camera just gets the heart rate up like not many games can do just kill me (laughs) (laughs) i'm i'd be dead i've watched i have i have it um and i have amnesia i just haven't played them yet because i get so terrified even just like watching streamers Mm. play it and i'm like no that's enough for me I still uh, remember very fondly of, of the OG THG crew running through the Outlast 2 demo when it came out and it was free to play back in the day. And we've got a got a slice over at youtube.com forward slash we are 8-bit where you can check out that video of all four of us working through that demo and just the different <laughs> reactions and emotions that we're throwing out there during that, you know, 20 minute slice that we all work through was, uh, yeah, it's it's all kinds of creepy. Mm. Hey, Ali. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting playthrough and it's very interesting to see everyone's different reactions to playing so yeah that's a classic that's an old one yeah but uh they're, they're still uh going back to that well they're working on like and, and releasing some sort of serialized vr based content for outlast these days and uh yeah which would you know how creepy and freaky that would be so uh yeah shout out to red barrel games for that all right um quick quick sort of temperature check from the the 8-bit nation so i've grabbed all the all their respective top fives from the people that sent those entries in thank you very much and i've averaged it out and going from five through to one so in fifth place we saw amnesia actually you know the dark descent was the original there amnesia coming in at five fatal frame coming in as the fourth base horror franchise (laughs) uh silent hill at three dead space at two and resident evil at one also saw some love for Parasite Eve, which is a really great horror game from 1998, and yeah. that was uh, done by Square Enix. Uh, we also got some love for System Shock, 
See, way back in 1994, we've got the uh, the remake that's coming out next year. Got to play the System Shock remake at PAX on the Lenovo show floor a, a couple of weeks ago. Really, really great. Uh, Eternal Darkness got some love as oh, well, geez, which yeah. is a game that came way back out on the GameCube in 2002. And it was actually the first M-rated game published by Nintendo. <gasps> And outside of that, also Luigi's Mansion got a couple of Aww. couple of bits of love, which was very un Mario esque, but it was um, cool that they sort of went this That's other cute. direction with Luigi's Mansion. <laughs> yeah. That's cute. <laughs> and Alien Isolation <laughs> is no, an no. Got some love from. <laughs> you got to go in, and Nothing on the back of that, just. <laughs> It's so great. It's so great. Or maybe just watch like a condensed playthrough or something because you've got to experience it. It's the best the best story from an Aliens game. You know, it's a low bar, but uh, it's it's the best. And I wanted to shout out to uh, at Mr. Shack, a.k.a. David Shack. He is the winner of our 8-bit merch pack. Uh, we've run the randomizer through the people that submitted those top five horror franchises so uh david i will slide into your dms in the coming days to get your address to send you some fantastic 8-bit merchandise but if you wanted to buy some because you didn't win that giveaway obviously shop 8-bit.net is the place to go in my very humble opinion it's got some of the best gaming based merchandise on the planet so shop 8-bit.net to check that out but let's jump into the final segment on the podcast here and the question I want to throw to you guys is, what's a movie or TV show you'd love to see adapted to a video game and why? Miss Hart, lead us off. Seven. Um, <laughs> I would, like, Seven's, like, my favourite movie of all time. So I'd really like to um, have some, like, fucked up Sherlock Holmes serial killer crime-solving game. So puzzles, grotesqueness, I just think it would be great. Are you playing the role as Brad Pitt or Morgan Freeman in this game? Is that sort of the the shoes you would fill, or do you Maybe play Morgan the Freeman? you do play the killer? No, 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 no. You're you're solving the crime. You're solving the crime. So maybe Morgan Freeman, because you need you know that rapscallion young detective and his story. I don't know. The movie's been out for a while, and it's like almost comedic. What the? But anyway, I won't spoil it. <laughs> yeah. What is in the box, Miss Hart? What is in the box? Is it a bunny? No, that's Con Air. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I would love a seven game. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. You could just That'd make it cool. into, you know, seven chapters, tying into each one of the victims and, and the, the seven deadly sins. And yeah, it'd be it'd be very unsettling. It, it makes me think that it'd follow a similar beat to, to something like... Um, like an amnesia where maybe there isn't much combat. It is just sleuthing and skulking around and. and... Oh yeah. No, I'm, I'm not anticipating combat. I I want like crime scenes. This could be uh, the the next game from like Harvester games. It could be a point and click from Harvester. Mm, I'd be down for that. I'd I'd hate to know what is in that box. We're we're losing you. I can hear you. Because your video, you are frozen, very animated. Oh, no. <laughs> like this. Hold on. It's just peak time in my area on the internet. Okay. Your audio's back. Oh, there you go. We've got okay, you again. Cool. It's because there was a guy on his motorbike, and I think it interferes with everything here. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a thing. <laughs> I, I don't know how the internet works. You don't, I don't know. know how it works. My grandma's probably streaming something. That's okay. It's it's moving it's moving smoothly now, okay. and we've still got the audio track. So, yeah, Kat, did did you want to lead us off? Because uh, we do have some similar similar crossover here with our respective uh, adaptations. We're hoping to see. Yeah, so I went with a television series because um, I think it was at the start of this year or end of last year they released the Silence of the Lambs television show, and um, I'm a huge Silence of the Lambs fan. I have a death head moth tattoo. Like that's how I'm, I've I've been watching Silence of the Lambs since I was like ten. Um, so huge, huge uh, Hannibal fan. But I thought it'd be cool to play as um, Clarice as she's first starting in the FBI because um, she just moves from one unit into the criminal profiling unit. You get a lot more of her story and like how she went with like what was going on with her family and her dad and the um the impact that those had on who she became as she grew up 
But she's not necessarily hunting Hannibal in this series. Um, it's a lot of different things that are going on and a lot of different investigation elements. So it's not just... Um, there is a serial killer that she is hunting, but I think it's pre-Hannibal Lecter, from what I remember. Yeah, I, I didn't mind the Clarice TV series. Mm. I thought it was well done. It was... It was a little uneven at times, but overall I really enjoyed the story and the actress whose name escapes me, Can't she remember. played Clarice really well. Mm. I think she's an Australian girl, if yes. I remember right, yeah. as well. So that was really cool. And and I guess jumping on the back of that, may, maybe the, the game that I'm talking about is, is the sequel to yours because uh, <laughs> mine is also set in this uh, Silence of the Lamb slash Hannibal Lecter universe and maybe the sequel would then put you in the shoes of Clarice after her coming up through the ranks in, um, you know, in the FBI and it's going to tie into the, the Hannibal TV series was my thought process. Oh, I so adore Hannibal. The first two seasons, phenomenal. The third season, a little, little janky. Ali really fell off the wagon near the back end of season two, I think. You were all in in season one and then... I was so all in. I was like, yes, Brandon, with a solid <laughs> recommendation. And then season two started happening. So I'm still sorry. I'm still <laughs> I'm still a little bit raw on, on that because I know, I, you know, got you to the highest of heights and then, then it crash landed and, and you're still a little bit dirty on me for that one. But um, I'm hoping we can take the best parts of Hannibal <laughs> and throw it into, into a video game where maybe... Maybe you're playing Will Graham instead of instead of Clarice. So we've we've got a, a different protagonist we're working on, and it is following those similar beats where you don't quite know that Hannibal Lecter is is a serial killer, and you could you know tie into those those parts where you maybe do have debriefs with Hannibal in Will's counselling sessions, and you are sort of tracking down and hunting these other serial killers, and because the show itself is stunning, it is visual art on the screen and mm. some of the some of the the death scenes and the way the bodies are laid out and how the victims are shown by all these very artistically minded killers it seems in this in this show would translate really well to a video game i think where some of those moments where you stumble across the body and they're strewn up this way or that way or displayed as a living collage or formerly living collage whatever it might be i think would really really work as a video game so uh Maybe we're just building out the the Silence of the Lambs or, you know, Hannibal or Red Dragon or whatever we want to call, call this world. We're building this out together by the sounds of things, Cat. Mm. You've got the first entry of the series. I've got the second one. We'll find someone else to maybe do a third. But I think anything in that vein would translate really nicely and uh, where you are... Like we're all we're all in this consistency here. We're all criminal profilers. We're all hunting bad people. We're all solving crimes and, and hunting murderers. So uh, I don't know what that says about the three of us that we've all landed on this. But uh, I feel we've got three franchises or two franchises there that will uh, translate to gaming pretty seamlessly. I reckon. I think so. Yeah. Well, yours would come first. I just want to solve shit. I'm all about solving things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And they'll be like, "Hey, this game did really well. Let's keep going." <laughs> <laughs> but uh 8-bit nation that brings us that brings us to the end of this very spooky edition of the hungry gamers cat thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule and jumping on here to riff with ali and myself uh, really appreciate you jumping on and sharing some insights uh is there anything you wanted to shout out or anything you wanted to reference that you've got coming up that uh listeners can can check out and also maybe just uh reiterate where they can find you and all your fantastic content yeah well i think that if you do want to keep up to date is just following me on twitter because i share everything we do with uh hear us scream there um yeah once we get this amazon issue sorted out the book will be available to purchase you can buy the kindle version now so um, that is available to purchase if you want to read that one instead. <laughs> and then you can buy the paperback when it's ready. I, I do love me a paperback. I am uh, waiting very patiently for my, my paperback to arrive so I can <laughs> read that read that, and then put it on the shelf with its uh, volume one brethren. So I'm uh, looking forward to that. But yeah, as I said, appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to jump on here and riff all things spooky, scary and everything else in between. 
Uh, we'll be back with our usual THG programming next week for episode 306. Obviously, you can find <laughs> Ali at Miss Ali Hart. You can find myself at Brendan 8-Bit. You can find Kat at CatSteed underscore. And you can find us all as a whole at We Are 8 Bit. We've managed to uh, yeah make it to the end, avoid the the evil and the horrific atrocities that has presented itself through this ninety or so minutes. Uh, <laughs> may your Halloweens be equally part spooky and fun. I don't know. I don't know. May the candy be delicious and pleasant. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, especially if they're Milky Ways because they're great. Yeah, I'm freaking right there. <laughs> I think I've dug myself out of that hole. All right, Apeit Nation, until next time, it is our pleasure to serve you this spooky based delicacy known as THG 305. But until next time, much love. And stay hungry. Do you know what the most frightening thing in the world is? The hungry gamers. They mostly come at night. Mostly. I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. I'm gonna die out of here. What do we do? Why don't we just wait here for a little while? See what happens. Can't you feel it? It's alive. Watching. Waiting.